century has witnessed several demonetizations when governments have decided that national currencies are no longer going to be legal tender. Now, it has happened in three kinds of situations. First, in situations of hyperinflation, where you measure inflation not in rates per annum, but in rates per month, per week, or per day. Such as Germany in the 1920s, or Argentina three times uh, in the 1980s. Second, in situations where countries are on the verge of collapse, economic, political, and social, Zimbabwe, 2015. Third, in situations where countries are in deep economic or political crisis, such as Ghana in 1982, Nigeria in 1984, Burma in 1987, Dyer in 1993, uh, Russia in 1991, or the USSR then. Uh, in most of these, in all of these, the outcomes range from complete failure to total disaster. Now, the situation in India was completely different at the time demonetization was announced by Prime Minister Modi from these three situations. It was an economy which had rapid growth, it had price stability, uh, it had a vibrant democracy, uh, with a established political process. Uh, therefore, it would seem that past experience has no relevance. At one level, that's right. Yet, history matters uh, in terms of counterfactuals. Uh, India was in the situation it was in, so it survived the monetization. Uh, had it not been, the impact would have been much more devastating. Now, the stated object as uh, Rikpiji said, was economic. Uh, wipe out black money, combat corruption, curb terrorism, and so on. Uh, but the unstated objective was political. Right? Uh, and I will say a bit about both. Now, let me begin with the economics, which is what Rajpik wants me to do. Uh, you know, there are three fundamental flaws in any economic logic that the government might have put forward uh, for demonetization. First, and Arun put this very nicely in his book, all black money is not cash, and all cash is not black money. Uh, people hold at most 5%, if that, I would say 1% of their undeclared income in the form of cash, the rest in the form of land, <coughs> physical assets, foreign exchange accounts, self elsewhere, bullion, whatnot, uh, or even working capital. Uh, similarly, all cash is not black money, because I may buy something from Mr. Sinha on which I pay tax. It is white. Mr. Sinha, in turn, buys something from a shopkeeper who evades sales tax. That money becomes white, uh, black. And when someone he sells it to uh, buy something which is invoiced, it becomes white again. So the color of money changes at all times. Uh, it is, depends on the nature of the transaction. The second, uh, the third flaw in the argument is the distinction between what economists call stocks and flows. There is at any point in time a stock of black money held in cash, physical assets, bullion, foreign exchange, what have you, all right? Uh, but demonetization can get only at that which is held in cash. Uh, but, and therefore, if you assume that it will wipe out that black money, uh, in this case, uh, the Republic of India proved Narendra Modi wrong, because all the cash was actually returned to the Reserve Bank of India. Uh, they had developed a wonderful market for old notes at discounted prices. Uh, so the, the stock was not wiped out. And nothing, absolutely nothing was done to address the flow problem of undeclared income that evade taxes, uh, that over invoice or under invoice transactions, once again to evade taxes. Nothing was done either to change institutions, rules, or behavior patterns of individuals, which would stop the generation of flows of black money. Now, in that sense, it never could have addressed the problem it was meant to address. 
Uh, and I would argue that the essential objective was political. Uh, it was unstated, but it was the big one. Uh, and let me give you my take on it. Mr. Chauhan gave his take. Uh, I am not in politics, I am an academic. Uh, first, Mr. Modi was halfway through the tenure of his government in late 2016. Uh, he had little to show for it in terms of promises that had been made. He had much to worry about in terms of promises that had not been kept. And therefore, he needed a big bank, uh, a, a, a bold uh, idea uh, that would catch the imagination of a man as a man of action. Now, I think there were three dimensions to this politics. I won't comment on, on the role of finance capital in this. Uh, first, uh, there was a, a populism which seemed to suggest that demonetization is anti-rich and therefore it is pro-poor. And this is a narrative that Mr. Modi sold to some of the people for quite some time. But whether it will sustain, only time will tell. Two, I think he was reaching out to the people directly, bypassing both the parental political organization and the political party. In that sense, it was reminiscent of Indira Gandhi's nationalization of the bank and a pro poor political stance that bypassed established parties and institutions. And third, I agree with the, with Prithviji that there were state elections to come. What better way? to defend the opposition that to wipe out the vote of black money, which everyone knows uh, that, that they hold. Now, the consequences, it doesn't take, doesn't need any conflict to tell you what the consequences will be. Uh, the consequences were clear. Uh, in an economy where 60% of output comes from the informal sector, where 95% of transactions are in cash, uh, output and employment took a beating. Uh, consumption expenditure came down because people did not have cash and the rich who had black money who spent it on luxury consumption, on, on tourism or even in working capital when investment crashed uh, because banks could no longer lend against the old notes they held. There was a 100% cash reserve ratio on the demand of that money and investment was always collapsing. So output certainly took a downturn and so did employment particularly in construction, in agriculture, and the worst hit state in that sense was Uttar Pradesh. Now, now, you know, in the decision, politics trumped economics. I had actually argued and written that ultimately economics will be able to trump the politics if its consequences persist or surface out of the time. Uh, but uh, the political outcome in Uttar Pradesh, which was our next, seemed to suggest that the narrative has been bought by the people. But I would argue it is perhaps too early to come to that judgment uh, because what happened in Gorakhpur is not unrelated to the economic and political and social consequences of demonetization. Uh, let me, before I stop, let me say one thing because we were meant to talk about has demonetization reduced corruption? You know, Corruption is as old as human time. We've had it for centuries. Virginia uh, wrote about it in our chapter. Every country in the world has corruption, more or less, but there are no exceptions, except perhaps the Nordic countries. Uh, but there are three attributes of corruption in India which make our corruption unique. First, corruption in India is not about the highest level or key decisions. It has percolated all the way down to the bottom, in every layer, in every strata. Second, corruption in India is not that, not functional in the sense Chicago economists think corruption is sufficient, no? as it is in Japan or Korea, where once you pay speed money, you are guaranteed the outcome. In India, you can pay the money and yet not get the outcome you want. And the third difference is that we are perhaps the only country in the world in which uh, people have to pay bribes to get their own rights as citizens. 
whether it is a birth certificate, whether it is admission to school, uh, whether it is getting a driving license, there is corruption everywhere. Now, I mean, I don't have such a vivid imagination. I do not see how one act of demonetization, which has no economic rationale, but it may have had a political purpose, whether it brings dividend or not, uh, I will leave the political persons on this dice to answer, but I will certainly return to it in our discussion. Sure. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Nair, very well put. Uh,